Um, let's pray for the offering, and then after I do so, if um, kind of exciting to look over there at the piano, I'll introduce them in just a moment. Heavenly Father, we're anxious to give back to you and your ministry. You've been very generous to us, and it's opportunity. We give joyfully. So take the offerings, the tithes, and we pray that it would be used in ways that are pleasing to you. So we commit the, the offerings to you. In Jesus' name, amen. That is, that is Ellison and daughter Lucy Lowe. Thank you so much. That is so beautiful. Thank you for doing that for us. Uh, if you have a Bible, turn to Romans 5. While the kids are making their way to Children's Church, which is to the door over on my right, they can head down there if they'd like. They're welcome to stay in with you if you prefer. Uh, but Romans 5, we're talking about peace. And everyone wants peace. From governments to your 60s, 70s hippies, from the Middle East to Middle America, we all want peace. There's some really common symbols. There are a lot of symbols for peace. A couple standard ones that we have. One is an olive branch. And if you take a look at the olive branch, it's, um, it goes back actually to 5th century. And do uh, you have those, Jay? Are you working on those? Um, the, uh, the olive branch really is, it's 5th century B.C., that's so common. I think we all know the two-finger one. That was World War II is when that started, and that, of course, meant victory. That's what that was used for. It just meant victory. We're looking for victory in the war. And then decades later, anti-war movement, it became, it changed its meaning, became kind of a peace type of a symbol. That third one is very, uh, is very often misunderstood. That third one is, um, it actually stands for nuclear disarmament. How many of you honestly knew that? Did you really? Not only does she do Advent candles, she's like full of, an, how would you possibly know that? Really? A church service? Yes, because we stand against nuclear weapons. That's like our main, it's on our sign out front. We're like, we're against nuclear weapons. And that's the point of the message today. If you have any in your garage or your barn, which being southwest Pennsylvania, you might. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I'm catching on. This area is uh, it's constitutionalist strange. So one of your weapons is nuclear. It is as a flag. They hold two flags for an alphabet. And the N is straight up, and then the D is off to the sides. And so it was nuclear disarmament. That's exactly what that was, and it was to stand for peace. And then slowly it evolved into this which many of us think of it as the broken arms of a cross and kind of an anti-Christian something or another, and that is not the case. It was exactly what Lindsay said back there. The world has always wanted peace. It's really such a central theme. This is how you can define it. Freedom from disturbance, quiet or tranquility. Freedom from disturbance, quiet or tranquility. What we're going to talk about is peace in, a, in three movements. Its origin and how peace plays itself out. We're going to look at that today especially in light of Advent, where was read for us earlier, 700 years before Jesus, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Heavenly Father, we're asking that you would speak to our hearts today, that we find a place, not in some abstract idea, but literal peace. Guide us today in Jesus' name, amen. It's a move. I want you to think of it in, in a movement, not as separate ideas. And the first one is so critical for us. And the first one is that we are to have peace with God. The actual origin of peace is that it is with God. So I'm going to be trite and I'm going to give the old bumper sticker no God, no peace, no God, no peace. Right? Any of you have that on your car? Lindsay? Nope, okay. <laughs> no God means absence of God, absence of peace. If you know, understand relationship with God, you know, understand relationship with peace. It recognizes the problem. It actually recognizes for us that the problems in the world today stem from a broken relationship with God. This is so critical for us to understand in order to make our way to having peace personally or as a nation to understand the origin of peace. If you had your Bible open, it's in Romans 5. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our greatest need for peace is in our relationship with God. We're separated from God because of our sin. And our sin and His holiness are incompatible. This only makes sense because God is the creator of all things. In fact, Colossians tells us that in Jesus Christ, in his deity, that all things are held together, created by him. So if we break a relationship with him, we have issue with all of creation. The brokenness and the lack of peace that we see anywhere and everywhere stems from the actual origin that peace is found in a relationship with God. You look practically, we're looking for peace in the Middle East today. Somehow, if somebody can bring a, a, a piece of paper that we could sign of a conflict that's been going on for 3,000 years, 
Now, I get it. There's that temporary, we, do, we agree to get along, but we call it a peace accord. Did that at the end of World War II after as many as 50 million people are killed? It's the Paris Peace Treaty. Oh, finally, peace. Now, I get it. I understand the wording, but I don't know if it's peace. There was a group of people that wanted to dominate against the world, and the world crushed them and then signed a treaty. Finally, peace. Well, okay. Yeah, I, I get that. An external get along, but internal. There's nothing's changed. Palestinian Israeli, you can externally end up with a contract of some sort, but internally nothing has changed. Because we can look on the outside for peace, and the truth is that peace, it's a presupposition that the church has, that those who study the Bible have. The presupposition is peace is found through a relationship with God. That's peace. There have been amazing tools to share the gospel, the great message of Jesus. I think one of the most famous of the leafless book, right, where it's just the colors, that's a fun way to share the gospel. That was actually a sermon by Charles Spurgeon called The Leafless Book. But it is interesting of what Billy Graham called his tract, his description of salvation. It's interesting what he titled it, Steps to Peace with God. Because that is, in essence, what salvation is. Sin separates us from God. There's no relationship with God. It's broken because God can't have fellowship with something sinful. So salvation is peace with God, tranquility and rest in our relationship with God. It's the very essence of what salvation is. And whether we use colors or reword it and use illustrations, it's all the same. God loves us. We brought hostility and broken relationship, yet God gave Jesus Christ so that belief in him, we have reunion with God and peace. Peace begins with God, and then secondly, it's then peace within us. Peace with God always first, has to be first. It's the very source of it. It's the origin of peace. Then it's peace within. Psalm 29 says, May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. In fact, John 16, Jesus in, he was leaving. Things were going to get bad. He told him so. And he says, I'm going to leave you with peace. John 14, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's peace then within. We have a lack of tranquility. We have a lack of rest. And you and I are regularly forced to think that it's something external. If only I can get a better job. If only I can get that family back together. If only I can get a little bit more money. If only we look to the exterior and think that's going to bring peace. That is exactly how the world thinks. If we can just get everything under control, if things around me are right, I can have peace within me. I'll tell you the worst part of that is the worst realization of that belief is that you now have zero control over peace in your life. You have none. That family, that relationship, that marriage is over. If you thought that a 
perfect family, the, the one spouse, two and a half kid type of family, the perfect one that everyone says is the perfect family, if you believe that you needed that for peace and it's gone, you are living hopelessly. It's not external. It's internal. I don't know if any of you have read any of Sadhu Sundar Singh, Lindsay? Really? Buy it before the service is over. Because I saw you on your phone just kind of on Amazon. You're getting some deals. Who's read Sadhu Sundar Singh? Some? Oh, I'm introducing you to him. This is a very unique uh, character. He's dressed as a sadhu, which is an East Indian religious leader, like a rabbi. So he was dressed like that so that he could communicate to his people, but his message is the message of Christ. No one actually even knows when he died. They know when he was born. It was 1889, and they're thinking sometime 1929 he kind of disappeared, going up into the Tibetan mountains to share Christ, and then never heard from again. The sadhu is interesting because... He, I hate to draw this parallel. He has so many unusual Jesus traits. Nothing that he has written is, in, uh, is available for us. The only things that we have of his that are books are things that people heard him say and they wrote it down. That's Jesus-like. Um, refused a home. Refused salaries. He wandered. I was speaking to a, a camp, Hume Lake Christian camp in, uh, outside of Fresno, California. And I'd mentioned something about Sadhu and this young uh, 20s, maybe 30, but 20s, uh, East Indian uh, Christian kid comes up afterwards and he's like, hey, pastor. I got a sadhu uh, story for you. And I'm like, oh, I'm always game. I love this guy. He goes, oh, no, no, this is a real, his great-grandfather, they were believers in their little village in India. In this little village, one night late, there was a knock at the door. It was him. They opened the door, and he said, I'm just traveling through, and I need a place to stay for the evening. I'll be out early in the morning. They invited him in. They had a meal together. They prayed through most of the evening. He was up well before sunlight and on his way. Well, that was what he was known for. And I'm like, your grandparents hosted this guy? And he goes, oh, yeah, the legends are all true. He really was that remarkable want you to know who he is, but I want you to hear this one line of his. Peace cannot be found in our own subconscious minds or our concentration, but only in the boundless ocean of God's love. Peace cannot be found in our own subconscious minds or our concentration, but only in the boundless ocean of God's love. This is the greatest news in the world. If you're living in a situation that is without peace, because of a troubling past that you thought you have put down, but you've been putting it down over and over, and it keeps showing up. The finances aren't under control. Honestly, you don't know what's going to be next. Some big decisions, but it's just going to ignore it. Maybe it'll go away. You're living in a turmoil, a lack of rest. The great news is that peace, contentment, rest, a restfulness is available through a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, then he'll fix all that? No, he might not. He might not fix any of that. Oh, Jesus never did have a house. 
Jesus never entered a town that he wasn't ultimately thrown out of. And the ending wasn't what we'd call peaceful. Oh, or was it? Oh, wait a minute, or was it? How could a guy, when everyone turns against you and your own followers have deserted, how could you possibly utter the words, For God, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How? No, you're supposed to come to that decades later as you finally have processed through all that counseling that cost you a fortune. Right? Yet you come to that later. No, he lived it. In fact, he is so much in peace because of relationship with his heavenly father that he actually was able to look down at his mother and say, John, you're going to take care of her, right? Will you take care of her? Like, are you really looking to the needs of other people in this, the greatest point of need in your life? Yeah, because he lives in peace not affected by external surrounding. In fact, there was a, another writer, Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen would say, if somebody or something can change your mood, you're too attached to other things and not attached enough to God. The phone call shouldn't ruin your day. If the phone call ruins your day, you're too attached to people and not attached enough to our source of peace. That's why Jesus' emotions were so consistent. When Jesus got mad, it was because he decided to get mad. He wasn't led into it. He decided to. When Jesus was calm, it's because he decided, I'm going to be calm, because he took his lead from the Heavenly Father and was so close to the Father that the mo emotion and the movements of God were his movements. But too many of us, our emotions and our movements are dictated by what's around us. They're angry around us, I'm angry. They come in an onslaught to me, I will go back at them. It's our struggle. But we have to go back, it's peace with God. Peace with God, and then peace within, but then it keeps going. Third one is peace with others. Peace with others. I'm not talking theory. We're actually talking very practically. Assuming that you have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ, A. But then the second one, uh, the second one fluctuates. The peace within. That's not a given. That's not, I have faith in Jesus Christ and I have peace with him. Oh, then I naturally live in peace and have it within me. Mm. No, that's not a given. It's why we wake in the morning. We want to read his word and we want to try to get into his mind and we want his word to infiltrate and clean our mind and we get in sync with him. And as we get in sync with him, his values become our values, his concerns. Then the peace that we have with God is within us. And as it's in us, it makes its way into the lives of those around us. So Titus 3 says, Slander no one, but be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. Oof. Have you met everyone? Man. No, don't take it as a command. You take it as a command. Oh, okay, I'm going to have to be peaceable to everyone. Check that box every morning. No, it's not this random command. It's a part of salvation. Salvation, relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And as I live in communion with him, 
as I live in communion with him and his ways become my ways and his thinking becomes my thinking. In fact, very specifically, Jesus' teachings, it would be live within the kingdom of God. Live within kingdom thought with him as reigning and ruling as I think that way. It's within me. And if it really is within me, it's going to flow through me into the lives of people around us. So, just to make this fun and more personal, more painful for you, you're like, no, 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 it's pretty painful already. No, it can get worse. If we're not peaceful to others, run this thing backwards. If we're not peaceful with others, it's because there's not peace within us. Now we're going to have to ask the question because there's two different paths here. Maybe I have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, but I've stopped it there and I'm not living in communion with him. Or I don't even have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. This is true of the other traits. If you and I are living in a love relationship with God and we go and we drink of the well of his love and grace and kindness, it just fills us and then it flows through us into the lives of others. It's the same thing. And you run that thing backwards, the same thing happens. If I'm not loving and kind and gracious and I'm just pouring all of that out on the lives of other people, don't start a checklist and be hard on yourself because you and I aren't capable of being that way. We just run it backwards. It's because it's not in me. It's not in me because of my discipline of my relationship with God. Either I don't know him at all, or I do know him, and my days are all about the news and my email and my work and my family and my schedule and my finances. Because I just live in the world. I was doing a wedding once. That was my wedding band. I was doing a wedding... I don't know if you remember this one. It was in Sun City, Arizona. And it was one of my first ones. And I had my Bible open. And I thought I was doing a good job. By the way, I wasn't. And they handed me the rings, which is always a problem. Who knows where that thing's going to end up? And I sat it on my Bible. And I kept talking. I said, well, the ring, the significance. And it slid off just like that, hit my foot went under the communion table, and I heard it hit a vent. And I'm like, well, there it goes now. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't a good sound. That was honestly what I thought of. I thought, I'm fine with dropping it. Is it going to go in a vent? And I said, oh, the ring, the significance. Well, there it goes now. The significance, and I'm trying to talk, and while I'm talking, I'm like praying, Lord, please don't have that ring down in the HVAC system of the church. I mean, this could, this could really be a damper on this. They hadn't paid me yet. So this was a big deal. <laughs> so, so then I finished and I said, uh, I said so let's, uh, while placing this ring, in fact, hang on a second, I'm going to go get it now. And I go under this table and you see my rear sticking out and I'm digging around. It was sitting right on the edge like steady hands like a surgeon. I was like this, oh, Lord. I came out and the place cheered. <laughs> I'm like, I got it, I got it. And they're all like, he got it. I got paid. Man, that was close. That was close. So it's right there, I can see it. So, so we're having lunch today. I don't know, I have any idea what we're talking about. Yeah, let's see, slander no one, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, we'll play it backwards, that was clever. Okay. Oh, yeah, it does work with love, too. Blah, blah, blah. Let's see here. Um, I don't know, you want another quote? Ah. A.T. Pearson? Any A.T. Pearson fans? Good for you. Can I give you an A.T. Pearson quote? This is so nice. Okay. 
The peace of God is that eternal calm which lies so far deep down in praying that it can't be reached by external disturbance. What he's talking about, they call it the cushion of the sea. I, don't, I, don't, I know there's a chicken of the sea. So I think it's different. What they're saying is that way, way down in the depths of the sea, if you dredge it, there are things that have been laying in the exact same place for hundreds of years. Storms at the top, chaos at the top, it is so far down, it's undisturbed. That's our peace. So Pearson the peace of God is that eternal calm which lies far too deep down in the praying soul to ever be reached by external disturbance. It's the peace of God. I read this week um, an artist, he's a street artist, Bansky. I follow Bansky a little bit. Some of his uh, stuff is through um, Palestine. It's it shows up in weird places. A recent one. I just read this yesterday. He said, when the power of love is greater than the love of power, the world would know peace. I went, oh, clever. Okay, that's clever. When the power of love is greater than the love of power, the world will know peace. That quote stuck in underneath the idea that God is peace, then yes. But that, which is not his point, his point, Bansky is just saying it to everyone, we just got to love more. If we could only just love more, it would be okay. It's not true. God loves you so much and he wants peace in your life, number one. But two, you disrupted it because of your sin. Your sin disrupted that. Peace is not available. But then Jesus Christ gave himself as a sacrifice that all who would believe in him, peace is available. That it's bridged, that broken gap between God's peace and my life is filled with Jesus Christ. In faith in him, I have peace. So there's the movement. Peace is from God, then it's within us, and then it's to others. That's the movement. But I'm actually going to add for free a fourth one very quickly because it really isn't quite complete until the fourth one. So again, peace is origin with God within us through faith in Jesus Christ and then peace with others as it flows through us, right? But then it also flows through us and it's peace for others. You and I have been charged with carrying the message of salvation and peace to a lost world that needs it. Do you agree with that? that that's it. That's true. And if there's ever a season, now's the season to do that. So, I gave you a little bit of a tool. You have a little tool, and it's in front of most of you. In front of most of you, there in the pew rack, there's little tracks. There's little tracks. It's based off of, that's actually based off of Billy Graham's tract. But that little tract is for you. There's several of them there. Take a couple of them. Clean them out. You're fine with cleaning those things out. You can take all of those, and they're very simple. There's nothing that profound about that little tract. It steps to peace with God. The first one is we understand that peace, love, eternal life is from God. The second one is we admit there's a problem. The problem is our sin. The third point we discover the bridge. We discover that Jesus Christ has made that peace once again available. And the last point is simply to receive Jesus Christ. 
put your faith and trust in him. I want you to take a couple of those, really clean those out of there, stick them in your car, put them somewhere, share the great peace of God in a world today that is in pretty desperate need. So let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, to thank you for the peace that you provide is almost embarrassing, it, but thank you. Help us to live in communion with you. Help us to live in that peace. Show that peace to those around us. And then, Father, what a privilege during this Advent season to be able to introduce somebody to you by sharing peace with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.